No hires from low-level rural areas. If anyone hires them, I'd love to see that. <laughs> As the interviewer, Mr. Smith, mocked me with these words, I was filled with anger. After laughing at my reaction, he pushed my resume into the trash can in the hallway. Unable to contain my fury, it exploded. Then let me show you. Saying this, I took out my mobile phone and made a call. The person on the phone answered immediately. While keeping eye contact with the interviewer, I called out to the person on the other end. Dad, the interviewer is asking for you. Unexpected it was. Mr. Smith, with his bonehead voice raised, I smiled triumphantly at him. Now, the counterattack begins. My name is Hazel Taylor, a 63-year-old housewife. After marriage and childbirth, I retired at the age of 55. I was enjoying my time playing with my early-born grandchild. But before my 60th birthday, my husband, Adam, was found to have cancer. Adam, three years older than me, had just decided to retire and we were planning to enjoy our retirement together. The discovered cancer was already in its final stages. Adam tried his best, but he passed away less than a year after its discovery. In shock and in a daze, my children and my father Robert conducted a funeral on my behalf. After retiring, Dad returned to our hometown in California and continued our family's grape farming business. Mom had passed away a little earlier, so Dad was running the vineyard alone. Although it was a small-scale operation, the grapes were of fine quality and traded at high prices. Dad's life was stable. Moreover, his daily dedication to the grapes seemed to have a positive effect. He looked much younger than his peers. Seeing Dad like this, I started to think that I shouldn't be down forever. So I decided to reapply for a job. Fortunately, having a CPA qualification made it easier for me to find work despite my age. Though Adam's inheritance was enough for living, I applied for an office job at a large corporation, something I had always wanted to try. I passed the document screening. The recruitment age was close to the upper limit, but my qualification must have worked as my son and I were delighted. Then, I received a letter for an interview at the headquarters, and I headed there. Most people at the interview venue were younger than me. Seeing them, I wasn't sure if I would be accepted, but I decided to go for it anyway. I noticed the older applicants looked downcast as they left the room, but I told myself it was just my imagination and knocked on the interview room door. Come in! In an interview room, one man was lounging with his arms and elbows on the table, and another sat upright with a computer in front of him. I tried to speak as loudly as I could, despite my nervousness. Thank you for this interview opportunity. My name is Hazel Taylor. I look forward to speaking with you today. Yeah, yeah, sit down. The man who seemed to be the boss, without looking at me, said so. I thought him rude, but reconsidered it might be a stress interview and quietly took my seat. All right, let's start the interview. Mr. Smith and I, Johnson, will be conducting it. Please, go ahead. Mr. Johnson, who seemed a bit unsure of himself, said this and extended his hand for a handshake. On the other hand, Mr. Smith, next to him, was still lounging and looking at me. It's just an old lady. Hey, Mr. Smith, I'm so sorry. After scrutinizing me from head to toe, Mr. Smith muttered something disrespectful in a low voice. Mr. Johnson hurriedly intervened and apologized, but Mr. Smith didn't seem to care. So, old lady, let's hear a name and a brief career history. Mr. Smith, that's rude. As Mr. Smith sneered at me with a nasty smile, my anger grew, but I thought this might just be a stress interview. So I decided to answer. I am Hazel Taylor, 
63 years old, I graduated from a four year university and worked in administrative roles at a local company. I retired about six years ago, enjoying time with my grandchild and helping with simple tasks at my family home. After losing my husband last year, I deeply wanted to work again, which led me to apply here. Mr. Smith looked at me with a clearly dissatisfied gaze. Then he picked up the resume I had sent for the first round, shook it, and threw it on the floor. We're not so free here to entertain a granny's pastime. Mr. Johnson quickly picked up my resume and apologized, but I was struggling to contain my growing anger. Mr. Smith seemed not to care at all, laughing and mocking me. Even if you graduated from a university, that was decades ago, wasn't it? <laughs> a young, beautiful woman could brighten up the office. But that's impossible with a granny. <laughs> you probably can't even use a computer, right? <laughs> I can use a computer, I retorted, feeling irked, and Mr. Smith glared at me. He must have been really annoyed, even totting at me. Mr. Johnson sat there, shrinking beside Mr. Smith, clearly showing the power of dynamic between them. A granny on a computer is not just about turning it on. You're not confusing it with a typewriter, are you? <laughs> it's embarrassing to be so stubborn at your age. <laughs> I've used computers for accounting and data entry at my previous job and at home. I can handle basic tasks. Mr. Smith seemed displeased with my responses, getting more irritated every time I answered. Don't you think this is what they mean by, okay, boomer? I'm not sure what you mean. I don't understand that reference. Unable to hold back any longer, Mr. Smith slammed the table with a loud bang. Silence filled the room. After a moment, Mr. Smith sat back down with a dry laugh and smiled kindly. Sorry about that. Get a bit carried away. Now, please tell us why you're interested in this position. Had he abandoned the stress interview approach? Confused by his sudden change of demeanor, I took a breath and answered. As I mentioned earlier, my husband's passing last year left me with more time alone. I wanted to be involved in the business beyond the grapes harvested at my father's vineyard. Your father runs a vineyard? I see. Mr. Johnson seemed genuinely interested, and a pleasant atmosphere began to fill the room. But Mr. Smith quickly shattered that mood. A vineyard? That's just some countryside stuff. <laughs> what a blank this is. <laughs> Suddenly, Mr. Smith burst out laughing. He laughed alone until he was satisfied and then swiftly moved to the door. That's it for the interview. You may leave now. Huh? Confused, I watched as Mr. Smith, smiling and pleasantly, opened the door for me. I reluctantly stepped outside. Mr. Smith and Mr. Johnson followed me out. I formally thanked them for the interview, though it was just a formality. Then Mr. Smith snorted and said, Normally, we'd send the results by May later, but you're not even worth that effort. I'll announce the results specially for you. Pointing at me, Mr. Smith raised his voice. No hires from low-level rural areas. If anyone hires them, I'd love to see that. <laughs> Filled with anger at Mr. Smith's mocking words as he looked at me, I couldn't hold back any longer. He laughed at my reaction and shoved my resume into the trash can in the hallway. Unable to contain my fury, it exploded. Then let me show you! Saying this, I took out my mobile phone and made a call. The person on the phone answered immediately. While keeping eye contact with the interviewer, I called out to the person on the other end. Dad, the interviewer is asking for you! What? It must have been unexpected. Facing Mr. Smith 
who let out a boneheaded voice. I smiled triumphantly. The counterattack begins. Granny, did you really bring your dad along for this? <laughs> As Mr. Smith left, I saw Dad walking up behind me. Mr. Johnson, noticing Dad, turned to him and bowed. Mr. Taylor, thank you for everything as always. What brings you here today? Ignoring Mr. Johnson's greeting in mid-sentence, Dad stood beside me. Mr. Smith, not understanding the situation, tilted his head, while Mr. Johnson turned pale upon realization. My daughter has been under your care. Ah, you're her father. Did you really just walk into our company? That's not okay. <laughs> This is what happens with country bumpkins. <laughs> Mr. Smith began to ridicule not just me, but also my dad. Then Mr. Johnson hastily apologized to dad. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were Mr. Taylor's daughter. Hey, Mr. Johnson, why are you apologizing to this old man? You really are clueless. Mr. Smith was oblivious to the situation, while Mr. Johnson became paler by the moment. Then, a man approached from the direction Dad came from. What's going on here? Ah, oh, Mr. Miller, good day to you. Just teaching her about the world. She brought her father to the interview. Mr. Smith bragged to Mr. Miller, the president, who looked displeased. Unaware, Mr. Smith pointed at me and continued proudly. We can't hire someone so delusional at her age. <laughs> Before I could react to Mr. Smith's words, the president spoke. The one who's mistaken is you. What? Mr. Smith looked confused at the president's words. This man is Mr. Taylor, who supplies our highest quality wine grapes. Thanks to her father, our company has been producing top quality wine since its establishment. Don't you know this? Being in sales? Oh, that's Mr. Taylor! Mr. Smith exclaimed in surprise. As I tilted my head in confusion, Mr. Johnson whispered to me, Your father's grapes are top-notch, using our most expensive wine. Everyone in sales knows how close he is to our president. Surprised by this new information, I realized how valuable Dad's grapes were. I knew they were delicious and traded at a high price, but I didn't realize their true worth. Mr. President, my daughter wanted to learn about the distribution process after our grapes are harvested. So I told her about this job opening. We had a dinner appointment after her interview, so I was nearby. I always thought highly of your company and have been in good terms with it. But it seems I was mistaken. I'll have to reconsider our future dealings. Mr. Taylor, I'm terribly sorry. This man has been extremely disrespectful, but our company isn't just filled with fools like him. Please, reconsider. Desperate, the president apologized beside Mr. Smith, who had turned from pale blue to white. He hadn't expected his actions to put his company in jeopardy, but then, remembering my presence, he turned to me fiercely. Why didn't you tell me who you were at the start? It's obvious. I didn't want to use my dad's connections. I wanted to be judge on my own merits, especially with my accounting experience And qualifications. Mr. Smith gritted his teeth in frustration. His unrepentant stubbornness was almost admirable. Then Mr. Smith desperately clung on. Then it's okay for me to reject her based on her age and such, right? Using your father like this is unfair, isn't it? Everyone was stunned into silence. Mr. Smith alone seemed to think he had won the argument. I sighed deeply before responding. No, I sought Dad's help because I thought your attitude was unjust. From the moment I entered, you were lounging with your elbows on the table, not even greeting properly. You ridiculed my responses and age. 
and you demean women's worth to just their looks. And finally, you abruptly ended the interview and threw my resume in the trash can. I did not do such things. Mr. Smith hurriedly denied it, feeling the president's increasingly cold gaze. Reluctantly, I reached into the trash can in the hallway, pulled out the crumpled paper, and handed it to the president. What is this? That is, um... Mr. Smith tried to snatch the paper back from the president's hand, but stopped at his stern glare. Frozen like a rabbit in the headlights, Mr. Smith watched as the president unfolded the paper. This is a resume. Yes, he crumpled up my resume and threw it away. At my words, the president widened his eyes and glared at Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, with no escape, was visibly shaking. I hope you haven't conducted similar interviews with other applicants today. No, not at all. I was just a bit irritated with Miss Taylor. I'm very sorry. Mr. Smith apologized. But I highly doubted that he had conducted proper interviews with others. Dad and the President seemed to share my skepticism, casting doubtful glances at Mr. Smith. All applicants interviewed today received the same treatment as Miss Taylor. A clear voice echoed in the previously silent hallway. Mr. Smith looked at the speaker in disbelief. Is that true? Yes, it's true. I have recorded it. The speaker, holding out an icy recorder, was Mr. Johnson, shaking slightly, but with eyes fixed firmly on the president. Mr. Smith, face red, tried to snatch the recorder from Mr. Johnson. Give it here! Do you want to be hurt like always? No, I won't give it! Desperately protecting the recorder, Mr. Johnson crouched down. Mr. Smith moved to kick him. Stop! What are you doing? The president intervened. Mr. Smith, utterly confused seemed to remember the situation. Oh, I mean, just now. What does just now mean? Have you always been treated like this? The president asked Mr. Johnson, who nodded emphatically. Mr. Smith looked utterly defeated. Since joining the company, Mr. Smith has been my supervisor, behaving oppressively, sometimes directly as seen today. Knowing I couldn't resist as a new employee, he pushed me to my limits every day. So when I learned that Mr. Smith would be the sole interviewer today due to HR's absence, I saw my chance, Mr. Johnson said, pressing the recorder's play button. Mr. Smith's crude laughter filled the hallway from the recorder. The contents were unbearably cruel. Social failures like you shouldn't apply here. Know your place. You don't look useful. There were even more egregious comments. Mocking applicants' work history, education, and specific remarks on their appearance. This is your voice, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, um... Even now, Mr. Smith tried to escape. But the president raised his voice. I am asking if this is your voice. Yes, it is. Mr. Smith answered reflexively, standing up straight. And then Mr. Smith slumped down, seemingly realizing there was no escape. The president glanced at Mr. Smith before turning to Dad and me to apologize again. I'm truly sorry for the unpleasant experience. Appropriate action will be taken against this individual. I'll personally apologize to the other interviewees later. I think that's a good idea. I've always known you to be an excellent manager from our past dealings, so if you handle this situation properly, we'll continue our business with you. Dad nodded in agreement. Relieved at the continuation of business, the president turned to Mr. Johnson, took the recorder, and immediately made a call. Hello? Yes, it's me. Can you come here? Wait in front of the interview room. Two minutes after hanging up, 
a man rushed over. The president explained the situation and pointed at Mr. Smith. The man nodded, forcibly made Mr. Smith stand up, gave us a brief nod, and dragged Mr. Smith away. That was the sales manager. I asked him to take Mr. Smith away with the evidence. Mr. Johnson, thank you for your courage in speaking up. I hope you continue to work with us. I'd be happy to. I was originally impressed by the company's management philosophy. Mr. Johnson's words made the president smile. After Mr. Johnson left, the president guided us to his office. I'll inform Mr. Taylor as soon as the decision about Mr. Smith's fate is finalized. It'll either be a transfer to an isolated district or dismissal. At least, he won't be interacting with Mr. Taylor anymore. Thank you. Dad seemed a bit relieved. The president also appeared relieved at not losing a vital business connection. Then he turned to me and apologized again. Hazel, I'm truly, truly sorry. No amount of apologies can make up for the discomfort you experienced. It's okay. As long as that interviewer is punished, I don't mind anymore. At my response, the president thanked me and apologized again, which I quickly tried to stop. It felt uncomfortable to have someone older repeatedly apologize to me. Dad, sensing my discomfort, broached a new topic. So will Hazel and the others get another chance at the interview? If they wish, after apologizing, we'll conduct the interviews again. This time, I'll join as well. What do you think, Hazel? I declined the president's offer. Understood, was all he said. Dad and I then stood up and left the president's office. Later, the president informed us that Mr. Smith was transferred to an isolated district. Initially, he thought of firing him, but after hearing from Mr. Johnson about Mr. Smith's temperament, he feared he might irrationally harm me. To keep track of his movements, they sent him to a sales office in an isolated district where trusted personnel were present. Apparently, Mr. Smith had no intention of leaving the large corporation and accepted the transfer, quietly working in desk jobs. Though Mr. Smith became a useless employee, further investigation in the sales department revealed his tyranny towards others not just Mr. Johnson. His previous accomplishments were found to be stolen from colleagues, proving he was always ineffective. Furthermore, it seemed he was married, but his wife divorced him following the transfer. One can only imagine he must have been just as tyrannical at home. It seems Mr. Smith was also having an affair and had to pay a significant amount in compensation due to the divorce lawsuit, which he complained about. The reason he forcibly became an interviewer that day was that he feared competent new hires would expose his incompetence, affecting his evaluation. So he planned to hire incapable people. He apparently took out his stress on applicants with better education and work history pointing out their faults. I was just dumbfounded when I heard this. By the way, Mr. Johnson was promoted afterward. His ability to handle Mr. Smith's unreasonable demands was outstanding. And once it was discovered that the achievements Mr. Smith had claimed were actually Mr. Johnson's, his evaluation skyrocketed. Now he's considered a young, hopeful talent in the sales department. When Mr. Johnson visited me, he was no longer the timid person he once was, but a confident, upstanding young man. As for me, I eventually gave up on re-entering the corporate world and decided to help out at Dad's vineyard. I let Dad focus solely on growing the grapes and took over all other administrative tasks. There's a lot to learn about managing a business, and every day is a study. But I'm working hard to share Dad's beloved grapes with more people. It's challenging, but I've found a new purpose in life, 
and I'm filled with motivation every day. Recently, my son and his wife moved to our area. Surprisingly, my daughter-in-law expressed interest in taking over the vineyard. My grandson loves grapes and says he wants to become a grape farmer when he grows up. Carrying the dreams of my family, I am energized to keep delivering our grapes to many more people. Don't live luxuriously on your husband's money. The comment from my mother-in-law, Wendy, freezes the atmosphere at the 60th birthday celebration I organized for my mom. In the midst of this, all right, let's split the bill then. My usually calm mom says. Wendy looks stunned and lets out a confused, huh? My name is Layla and I'm 37 years old. I quit my full-time job when I got married two years ago and now work part-time while supporting my husband, Walker. Life was great until last month when we started living with Wendy. The reason? My father-in-law passed away. He died of cancer three months ago, leaving Wendy to live alone. Wendy felt scared and lonely living by herself, so we moved into Walker's family home. Before we got married, Walker had told me, I'm an only child, so I'll have to take care of my parents. I want to be there for them, especially if they need caregiving. Wendy is a kind person. So I agreed to live with her in the future, even offering to help with caregiving. She never interfered in our marriage, and she was a great homemaker when my father-in-law was alive. I respected her and thought I was lucky to have such a good mother-in-law. So we started living together earlier than planned, and I was looking forward to a happy life as a family of three. But I never expected Wendy to turn out the way she did. A month into living together, we started to feel more comfortable around each other. Hey, Layla, I want to eat hamburgers for dinner tonight. Can you make some? I often get dinner requests like this. Sure, let's have hamburgers for dinner tonight. Some mothers-in-law apparently won't eat anything their daughters-in-law cook, but Wendy enjoys my cooking. She never complains about my cleaning or laundry either, making it easy for me to manage the household. I'm really glad we're living together, Layla. She even says, making me feel fulfilled. It makes me happy to be praised by someone I respect. However, I sometimes wonder why Wendy doesn't do any housework. She praises me, but never lifts a finger herself. She leaves her dishes in the sink and doesn't even take her trash out. It's like living with a traditional dad. On top of that, if you eat sweets, leave the garbage on the spot. When I clean, I find crumbs everywhere, presumably from snacks Wendy has eaten. Wendy lives on the inheritance and survivor benefits from my late father-in-law. Walker gave all the inheritance to Wendy, saying, My mom put up with my dad's whims all her life. I didn't quite understand, but it's not my place to get involved in their financial matters. As long as they're both okay with it, I thought it was fine. But when Wendy spends her days doing nothing... Living off my late father-in-law's inheritance and survivor benefits, it starts to bother me. I wish she'd at least clean up after herself. She used to be so good at housework when my father-in-law was alive. Why has she become so careless now? Curious, I gently asked Wendy about it. My husband was a very strict man, and I couldn't defy him. Now that he's gone, I'm finally free. It turns out my father-in-law was a Henpecked husband, and Wendy felt she couldn't go against him. I remember how he used to sit during meals, ordering Wendy around. Was that what it was? Now I understand what Wendy meant, and I can't help but feel sorry for Wendy. I'll take care of the housework from now on, I decide, considering Wendy's feelings. But then, Wendy starts making more and more demands. Can you take a day off from your part-time job today? I want you to drive me to my friend's place. I can't take a day off. I firmly decline. And she says, Is your pocket money that important to you? Excuse me? I can't believe what I'm hearing. Spending money? I work part-time for the family, not for pocket money. 
Considering we've just started living together and will continue to do so, I don't voice my complaints. Hey, we're out of milk. Can you go buy some now? I can't start my day without milk. Can't you see I'm about to leave for work? If you hurry, you won't be late. Hey, Layla, my trash can is full. Take it out. And while you're at it, vacuum and mop my room. It's getting dirty. Wendy starts taking advantage of my willingness to do housework without complaining. This is too much. I gently tell Wendy what I can't do. I'm telling you to do it, so do it. Why can't you? She gets furious. I'm at my wit's end and decide to consult Walker. Seriously? I'm sorry. Walker apologizes and immediately scolds Wendy. Mom, you should take care of yourself. Unlike Layla, who works part-time, you're home all day. But Wendy just brushes it off. Yeah, yeah, I get it. She clearly doesn't. I start to feel uneasy about this living arrangement. Walker seems to sense my feelings. I'll take care of Mom as much as I can. If there's anything I can do, just let me know. I feel relieved by Walker's words. And true to his word, Walker starts dealing with Wendy's whims. But Wendy isn't happy about it. Why is Walker doing this? Layla, as his wife, you should be the one doing these things. Walker is the breadwinner, and you're just a part-timer. You think it's okay to make a tired Walker do this? Come on, Layla, wash my dishes right now. At this, Walker is furious. Hey, Mom, stop making Layla do everything. If you're going to talk like that, shouldn't you, who does nothing all day, be the one doing the housework? He has a point, but Wendy is angered by Walker's words. What are you talking about? Your father always told me, a wife must take care of the family. A wife must obey her husband. Now that he's gone, I'm not anyone's wife, and I'm the head of this household. That means Layla, as your wife, should be taking care of me. Is Wendy still bound by my father-in-law's words? I can't hold back and argue with her. Wendy, times have changed. These days, no one thinks that way about wives and husbands. You need to change your mindset. Walker nods in agreement. But Wendy's face turns red with anger. What are you saying? Are you calling me outdated? How dare you as a wife say such terrible things to me? I'm shocked. Then Wendy continues to vent her anger at me. The only reason I taught you how to do housework was so you could do it all when we lived together. I agreed to live with you because I wanted an easier life after all the hardships I've endured. Even Walker is surprised by her revelation. Look, I get it that you've had a tough mom, but it's not okay to treat Layla like a slave. And it's not okay to move in with us for such a selfish reason. Exactly. Wendy has no comeback. Enough. I'm disappointed that you're siding with her over your own mother. She storms off to her room and slams the door. Walker and I sigh. <sighs> Layla, I'm really sorry. You don't want to live like this, do you? I nod slightly. Then comes a surprising suggestion. Should we stop living together? What? I never thought he'd suggest that. I didn't expect mom to become so selfish after dad passed away. But we can't keep living like this. Let's move. I'm happy to hear this. But moving now is a concern. In fact, my mom's 60th birthday celebration is just around the corner, and I'm the one organizing it. I've just bought an expensive gift for her, wanting to give something special back to the woman who raised me. Moving would be another big expense. When I mention this, Walker also looks troubled. Plus, we've just moved here, and Walker's savings have taken a hit. Moving now would be difficult, but we can't put up with Wendy anymore. We ponder what to do, but can't find an answer. In the end, we put the moving idea on hold. And so, we continue to endure Wendy's whims and clashes. The stress is piling up, and we're both exhausted. In the midst of this, my mom's 60th birthday celebration is approaching. It's next month, huh? As Walker and I discuss the celebration, Wendy joins the conversation. What's happening next month? We proceed to explain. So please, have dinner alone that day. I'll prepare the meal for you. 
When I said that, Wendy, as usual, made a selfish demand. I'm coming too. You're coming too? I couldn't understand why Wendy, who had only met my mom a few times, would say that. Walker seemed to feel the same way and asked her, a bit annoyed. Hey, why would you come, Mom? It's for Layla's mom's 60th birthday celebration. Then came an incomprehensible reply. Well, I never got a 60th birthday celebration from Layla, so you should celebrate me too. What? Neither of us could make sense of it. Wendy is 63, and when we first met, she was already past 60. Yet she's demanding a celebration? Walker couldn't understand her logic either and kept arguing. This is ridiculous. But Wendy wouldn't budge, insisting, I'm going! Celebrate me too! So they kept arguing. This was getting nowhere. Fine. If my mom agrees, then Wendy can come too. I called my mom. Would it be okay if Walker's mom also joins the 60th birthday celebration? My mom graciously said, Sure. Yay! Then I'm coming to the 60th birthday celebration! Ugh. This is turning into a hassle. Walker and I exchanged glances, both probably thinking the same thing. But we had no idea what was coming. Little did we know that Wendy's selfishness would escalate even more on this particular day. On the day of the 60th birthday celebration, we headed to my parents' house by train. Why are we taking the train, Layla? What happened to the car? I hate trains. My mom loves her alcohol, and the plan was for everyone to drink. That's why we couldn't drive. When I explained, Wendy looked displeased. Well, you could just abstain from drinking, Layla. I'll drink your share, too. So get off the train now and go rent a car. I can't do that. My mom is looking forward to drinking with me. I said, refusing her demand. She kept grumbling. It's not like the train ride was that long. It's only about 20 minutes from our house to my parents. Despite feeling embarrassed by her loud complaints on the train, Walker and I finally arrived at my parents' home. We were greeted by my mom, who then said hello to Wendy. Layla is always in your care. I hope she's not causing any trouble. <laughs> Wendy laughed and responded in a way that was completely out of line. Ha 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 She's always a handful. She does the housework I've taught her. But she's so busy trying to make extra money that she sometimes doesn't listen. But hey, she's the wife Walker brought home. Walker immediately scolded Wendy. Mom, what are you saying? My mom and I were stunned. Ignoring that she wasn't even a family member, Wendy led the way into the house. You're having a hard time living with her, aren't you? My mom whispered this to me so Wendy couldn't hear. I could only respond with a wry smile. When we got to the living room, the catering we had ordered was already there. I had told my mom, You don't have to do any of the serving or cleaning. So Walker and I started setting the table. Why are you making Walker do this? You should do it yourself. I couldn't believe she would say something like that here, too. Walker was visibly frustrated, while my mom quietly observed, Wow, this looks delicious. I didn't expect to eat such a feast. I'm glad I came all this way for this 60th birthday celebration. She's a guest in someone else's home, yet she acts like this? Did she have no common sense? The celebration began with a toast. My own father passed away four years ago. Wendy used that as a topic to steer the conversation. Your husband passed away too, right? Isn't life great living off the inheritance and survivor's pension? I've been having a blast since my husband passed. I couldn't believe she could bring up such a topic so casually. I ate my meal with a strained face. Every time Wendy said something inappropriate, Walker would step in saying, Stop it, Mom. He looked exhausted. We both regretted bringing her along, to say the least. For the record, my mom works and doesn't rely on my dad's inheritance for survivor's pension. She seemed taken aback by Wendy's comments, too. Then the topic shifted to the catering I had ordered. So, this is delicious, but how much did it cost? Was it expensive, like $200 or $300? Another tone-deaf comment. 
Just as I was getting fed up, Wendy suddenly became angry. You know, it's fine to celebrate your mom's 60th birthday, but doing it with Walker's money isn't right. Use your own spending money. What is she talking about all of a sudden? I paid for this catering from my own part-time job earnings. But Wendy wouldn't listen. You can't possibly afford such an expensive meal on your measly salary. She even went as far as to say that. Don't be so cheeky, spending your husband's money like that. Why would she say such a thing during my mom's 60th birthday celebration? I deeply regret bringing Wendy along. I can't forgive her for creating this atmosphere. I was about to lose my patience and tell Wendy off. When at that moment, All right, let's go Dutch then. We'll split it four ways. How does that sound? It was my mom who spoke. What? Everyone was shocked. My mom, who had stayed silent every time Wendy made an outrageous comment, was now suggesting this. What? What? Wait, what are you saying? Going Dutch on a 60th birthday celebration? That's absurd. Wendy was rattled by my mom's words. In response, my mom spoke confidently. Layla has explained multiple times that she paid for this with her own money, right? But Wendy, you wouldn't accept that, insisting it must be Walker's money. So I thought doing Dutch would settle this. Wendy was speechless. My mom continued. Oh, and Wendy, please pay with your own money, not the money left by your late husband. At this, Wendy became furious. What? Why do I have to be told that by you? Facing Wendy's red-faced, loud outburst, my mom responded calmly. Well, you did say, don't indulge in luxuries with your husband's money, didn't you? So it would be wrong to use your late husband's inheritance, right? Fair point. Wendy had nothing to say, but she was so furious that she started to say something ridiculous. Well, it's fine for me, but not for Layla, because Layla is using my precious Walker's hard-earned money. If a wife spends it carelessly, of course a parent would get angry. She's talking nonsense. Walker and I exchanged incredulous glances. I get it. I really do. I'm angry, too. I'm frustrated that my dear daughter is being unfairly scolded by Wendy. At this point, Wendy seemed at a loss for words, struggling to come up with a retort. Um, well, you see. Shuddering and flustered, Wendy was silenced by my mom's next words. Initially, I was going to let it slide, watching you berate Layla. I didn't want to cause any issues in your future living arrangements, but enough is enough. You're the one living lavishly on your husband's money, and you dare tell my daughter not to do the same. Are you kidding me? How can you demean and belittle my daughter in front of me? What would you think if I did the same to Walker right now? Wendy was completely silenced. I never knew my mom could get this angry. Neither Walker nor I could hide our surprise. Wendy, now quiet, seemed regretful and teary-eyed. She grabbed Walker's hand and stood up. Walker, let's go. I can't stay here any longer. For some reason, she tried to leave with Walker. Walker, of course, didn't go with her. He shook off her hand and snapped. How selfish can you be, Mom? Enough is enough. Wendy started to cry. What now? Even you, Walker? Everyone's treating me like the villain. I was thinking of you when... Before she could finish, Walker shouted. Cut the crap. What's for my sake? Apologize to Layla right now for ruining the 60th birthday celebration. Wendy was visibly shaken by Walker's fury. He seemed so forceful that it looked like he might hit her. Perhaps because of that, Wendy complied meekly. Um, I, I'm really sorry. I truly apologize. Wendy offered a heartfelt apology to me and my mom. After all the time she had bossed me around, she was finally apologizing sincerely. So I thought about forgiving her. Yeah, right. I'm sorry, but I can't put up with Wendy's selfishness anymore. Ruining my mom's 60th birthday celebration made me realize that I can't live with this person any longer. Please, let's end this living arrangement. With the atmosphere already tense from my mom and Walker confronting Wendy, I unleashed my pent-up anger. That said, I never thought I'd be able to say all this to Wendy. Wendy was shocked when I suggested we should stop living together. She clung to me with a loud voice. 
Please don't say we should part ways. I'm truly sorry. I messed up today. But from now on, I'll take care of myself. It's too late for that now. So as you've said, take care of yourself in your own home. Also, remember you mentioned not living large on my husband's money? Starting today, you'll need to find a part-time job and earn your own keep. My point was, own up to what you say. Wendy was taken aback. No, no, that was a mistake. I take it back. I didn't mean that part about not using my husband's money. Walker chimed in, a touch of irony in his voice. So, moving forward, Layla can do whatever she wants with my money, right? Exactly. Ah, uh, well, um... Wendy was at a loss for words. I was on the verge of bursting into laughter. Everyone blamed her, and she was clearly out of options. Walker didn't hesitate to lay it out straight. Stop depending on my dad's inheritance. Layla and me, we'll separate our living arrangement. And mom, you need to work. Wendy kept repeating, Impossible! Look, dad's inheritance isn't endless. One day, it'll run out. Can you live on just survivor benefits and your own pension? You're not actually planning on depending on my salary, are you? Wendy looked utterly confused. How about working part-time at a subsidiary of my company? Walker made a helpful suggestion, but Wendy kept hesitating, saying, But no! Then I can help you. We'll move out soon, and I'll cut off all contact. Considering recent events and today, I think it's fair. Wendy panicked at Walker's finality. Fine, I get it. I'll do it. Just don't cut me off. And that's how Wendy put an end to her freeloading life. So, the disastrous 60th birthday celebration came to an end. We all apologized to Mom and hurried home to start looking for a new place and packing. As soon as we found a new home, we moved. During this time, Wendy was noticeably more considerate, just like when we started living together. She even started helping with the chores, but that didn't mean we could continue living together. Wendy, please reconsider! I had been saying no every time she asked trying to make her reflect on her actions. It seemed Wendy was having regrets about her own behavior. Walker, my husband, had a proposal for her to work at his subsidiary company. If you slack off or are late, I'll hear about it. Plus, it's a subsidiary of the company where your son works. If you screw up, it'll reflect badly on me. He figured a reasonable mom would consider. Basically, Walker was taking control until Wendy couldn't mess her life up anymore. He's a tough cookie, I thought. Days later, Walker told Wendy, I spoke to the factory manager at the subsidiary. You have a job interview. With no escape, Wendy reluctantly went to the interview. She got the job and started working five days a week. Since she had been so lazy before, work seemed pretty hard and she spent her days off sleeping. As Walker had suspected, her work ethic was quite diligent lest she ruin her reputation and, by extension, his. Working five days a week made her too tired to make a mess at home, which helped keep the household in order. In the midst of all this, she confided, How long will I be stuck like this at my age? Living alone is lonely. If she hadn't been treating me like a slave, everyone could have been happily living by now. By the way, we had to redo the celebration for my mom's 60th birthday because Wendy had ruined it the first time around. It took some time to save up the money. Of course, Wendy wasn't there. When I proposed to my mom that we redo the 60th birthday celebration, she declined, saying, I appreciate the thought, but it's too expensive. Your feelings are enough. In that case, I said, and decided to prepare a nice meal at home. We had a delightful 60th birthday celebration redo. My mom was overjoyed, and Walker also celebrated with us. Hey, Layla, you're not drinking. Well, actually, that day, my mom saved me from the unpleasant Wendy. They say motherhood is a strength, and it's true. I've been frustrated and stressed by Wendy, so this event reminded me of how great a mom can be. I want to be a mom who, no matter my age, cherishes her children just like mine does. I returned home after spending an extended two months at my parents' house following the birth of my baby. But what awaited me there was a situation I couldn't believe. You and I are divorced. Please leave this house. Unbeknownst to me, 
My husband had filed for divorce while I was away. Another woman had already made herself at home, claiming my space. Even my mother-in-law took their side, erasing me from the picture. They treated our newly born daughter as if she were an inconvenience, without even seeing her once. In an instant, I was pushed out of their lives. But I know one thing, their future is anything but bright. My name is Cecily, and I'm 32 years old. I have been married to my husband for three years. Currently, I'm nine months pregnant, with two months left until my due date. Meanwhile, my husband, Gail, is having an ongoing affair. How did I find out about his infidelity? It happened due to a series of coincidences. One day, a little after my pregnancy was confirmed, my usually busy husband forgot his mobile phone at home. I was debating whether to call him at work when a notification popped up on the lock screen. Looking forward to our date today, Seeing the incoming message, I let out an involuntary shout. What is this? The message left no room for doubt. He was cheating. I knew my husband's passcode. It's the debut date of his favorite artist. That piece of information was my saving grace. I unlocked the phone and opened the messaging app. The conversation with his affair partner was pinned to the top, signaling her importance to him. The woman's name seemed to be Rilana, and there they were, exchanging love notes on a daily basis. Looking back through the chat history, their relationship started a year ago, apparently they first met on a dating app. Somewhere along the line, it escalated into something extraordinary. I was so shocked, my hand trembled holding my phone. Gail, how could you? My emotions are in turmoil swinging between sadness and disbelief. The thought of divorce flashes across my mind, but I'm pregnant with Gail's child. It's unthinkable that this child could grow up without a father. But can I really turn a blind eye to Gail's affair? What if he continues this relationship even after our child is born? The worst-case scenario sends shivers down my spine. Overwhelmed by severe nausea, I hurriedly rushed to the bathroom. I have been suffering from morning sickness lately, spending most days lying down. Unable to eat properly, I'm mentally and emotionally drained. I don't have the energy to confront Gail about his affair. Raising my voice could negatively affect the baby. After much thought, I decide to ignore Gail's cheating. Of course, I'm anxious. But more than that, I want to prioritize our unborn child. Once the baby's here, I'm sure Gail will change. I desperately tell myself to calm down. Months have passed, and I'm nearing my due date. But nothing has changed about Gail continuing his relationship with the other woman. Tonight, he came home after 11 p.m. I was already on edge and I couldn't help but raise my voice. Gail! Isn't it too late? I'm almost at full term, you know? He responded with an annoyed tone. What can I do? I have work, you know? That may be true, but even cleaning the bathroom is hard with this belly. Could you help out a little? Oh, come on, stop nagging. You get to relax at home all day, right? I'm the one working here. What's that supposed to mean? It's the truth. You know what? Maybe you should go back to your parents' house early. It would be less stressful for both of us. Are you serious? Gail, wait a minute. He walked away right in the middle of our conversation, heading straight for the bathroom. Lately, our talks have been nothing but half-hearted or limited to essential things like errands. When was the last time we had a real full conversation? I can't even remember that's how rare our meaningful dialogues had become. Maybe he really can't stand me anymore. Ever since that day, He's been coming home even later. So there I was doing all the house chores, grocery shopping, and even getting ready for childbirth all by myself. I also kept collecting evidence of his affair. If his attitude doesn't change after the baby is born, divorce might be the only option left. I hired a private investigator to gather evidence and even look into his mistress, Rilana. 
According to their report, Brilana had multiple affairs besides my husband. On top of that, she was pregnant. Is the child his? Or someone else's? Either way, this would serve as important evidence. So I kept collecting proof, preparing for the worst-case scenario. Then, one day, as my due date approached, I decided to go back to my parents' house to give birth. I was in the middle of packing when my mom called. Hello, Cecily, how are you feeling? Oh, mom, the baby's kicking like crazy today. It seems like they can't wait to come out. That's great to hear, so will Gail be coming with you? What should we prepare for dinner? Uh, well, what's wrong? I don't think Gail is coming. What? You're not planning to travel by train alone, are you, with luggage? My mom's concern was valid. It's a three-hour train ride from where we live to my parents' house. Ideally, my husband would drive me, but he recently told me to go alone. My mother, raising her voice, interrogated me further. Cecily, did something happen with Gail? It's unthinkable for a pregnant woman in her last trimester to take a train alone. Gail must be busy, I'll be fine on my own. But what if something happens? You can't just get off a moving train. I'll manage. My checkups have been fine and I've been doing the grocery shopping by myself. Wait, you've been going shopping alone? Uh, yeah. Continuing the conversation would only make me more suspicious. Digging myself into a deeper hole, I decided to swiftly wrap up the conversation and hung up the phone. Sorry, mom, I'll call you back. Wait, wait, Cecily! Looking forward to coming home. Bye! Though I felt guilty, I didn't answer my mom's return calls. That evening, my husband returned from work in a surprisingly foul mood. He stomped in, tossing his bag on the floor. As soon as he saw me, he started yelling. Hey, what's the deal? What did you tell your mom? What? Uh, what do you mean? Got a call from your mom today. Cecily seems to be struggling. You should support her more. Now, it looks like I'm not doing anything. Oh, well, turns out my mother felt sorry for me and had called Gil. My decision not to take her call backfired. Gil's face turned red with anger, his teeth clenched tightly. As I was about to apologize, he cut me off. Enough. My mom is coming over starting tomorrow. Your mom? Why? To make sure you don't mess things up. I don't need her thinking weird stuff about me. She'll take care of the house, got it? But having her move in so subtly, we would be walking on eggshells. What? Whose fault do you think this is? Just do what you're told and realize it's your fault, you idiot. He angrily clicked his tongue. Every time I tried to explain, he shouted, Shut up, this is your fault. In the end, we never had a proper discussion. The next day, his mother arrived. She had clearly been poisoned against me by my husband and she continued to berate me. I never thought Cecily would be so selfish. You should be grateful just to be married to Gail. You don't understand. There is a reason. What don't I understand? Because of you, my son has a bad image in your mother's eyes. Marrying a stupid wife like you was the mistake of a lifetime. I feel sorry for Gail. After that day... Life at home became even more strained. Conversations with my husband dwindled to nearly nothing, and I was left alone with my mother-in-law during the day. She didn't help with household chores and only criticized my actions. Unable to tolerate this, I decided to temporarily move back to my parents' home earlier than planned to give birth. When I mentioned going home, my husband casually said, Do whatever you want, <laughs> My mother-in-law added fuel to the fire by saying, Don't come back if it's not a boy. Yes, I had purposely not found out the baby's gender. I wanted it to be a surprise. Yet, to hear such a thing, all I hoped for was a healthy baby. Once back at my parents' home, I spent the remaining time of my pregnancy in peace. A month later, my daughter arrived a little ahead of schedule. Weighing over 105 ounces, I named her Clara. She was so adorable, I thought, even if she's a girl, my mother-in-law would surely love her. Once my husband saw his own child, I was sure he would stop his foolish affair. But neither he nor my mother-in-law came to visit Clara. 
not during my hospital stay or even after we were discharged. I tried calling and instead of my husband, my mother-in-law yelled at me, can't even have a son. My parents were livid. Though they tried contacting my husband Gail multiple times, he never responded. My parents told me, you don't have to go back to such a terrible husband. My husband, who wouldn't even come to see his daughter, and the struggles of new motherhood were taking a toll on me. I was approaching my physical and mental limits. I was supposed to go back after the one-month checkup, but fear kept me at my parents' home, caring for Clara. What should I do next? Even if I go back home, Gail won't visit Clara. If I return, he probably won't help with raising her either. That's when I began seriously considering divorce. Planning to make a final decision, I decided to return home once. A few days later, I left Clara with my parents and went back to my husband's home after two months. But what I found there was beyond belief. Wait, why is she here? My favorite sofa was occupied by Rilana, my husband's mistress, and in her arms, a newborn baby. That's when I remembered that Rilana was also pregnant. Mother-in-law was cooing. Boys really are adorable, aren't they? Upon noticing me, she opened her mouth sarcastically. Oh, Cecily, what brings you here? Uh, mother-in-law? Mother-in-law, drop it, would you? I have already set up a new daughter-in-law. A new daughter-in-law? Yes, Gil's girlfriend. Rilana gave birth to a boy and she's far better than you. I was speechless, hearing mother-in-law say that so blatantly. My husband looked at me and laughed as if mocking me. We are already divorced. I'm living with her now, so you better leave. Divorced? What are you talking about? I haven't signed any divorce papers. I did it for you. Be grateful. After all, you're the one to blame for not giving birth to a boy. Rage boiled up in me like dancing flames. Any love I had for my husband was gone. I held back my urge to yell and told him, Fine, I'll accept the divorce, but is that child really yours? What? What are you talking about? Do you guys even know your affair partner there, Rilana, was it? She's been involved with many other men. What? How do you know that? Because I knew all about Gail's cheating. I ignored it, thinking he would change after Clara was born. Clearly, I was foolish. My husband looked shocked. He probably never thinking his affair was out in the open. He was visibly disturbed by how easily I accepted the divorce. I coldly told him, Divorcing you is a wish come true for me, but in return, stay out of my life. Clara and I will live on our own. And let's forget you were even a father. Oh, and I expect full alimony in the divorce settlement. Got it? That includes from Rilana. Hold on. What do you mean Rilana has other partners? Is this true? Yes, it's true. I had a detective look into it. Why not get a DNA test if you're so doubtful? You might find some interesting results, including who the real father is. Is this true, Rilana? Rilana looked away uncomfortably at his questioning. Answer me. Well, that's what you get for a relationship that started on a dating app. Unable to bear it any longer, my husband turned to me and began to plead. Well, wait, hold on. If that's the case, I'm fine raising a child that's ours. I don't have any obligation to raise someone else's kid. Shut up. Trying to act like a father now? You've got to be kidding me. Everyone in the room shuddered at my raised voice. You never lifted a finger to help me while I was struggling through pregnancy. Don't even start with your nonsense. I have completely fallen out of love with you. I can't stand the sight of you. Don't ever show your face in front of me and my child again. Amidst my own heavy breathing, I hurriedly packed up my belongings. Ignoring my husband's calls, I walked out of the house. Later, I contacted a lawyer to claim alimony in the divorce court against my ex-husband and his affair partner. I also demanded child support from him and made sure he paid it all at once. After some time, I received news from Gail about the DNA test results. As expected, the child born from Rilana wasn't his. 
confronted with these results, she had this to say. All I needed was someone with money. Turns out, she never loved Gail. As soon as the truth came out, Rilana took the child and disappeared. Mother-in-law was furious about the whole situation. She's demanding Gail to bring me back and he has been flooding my phone with messages. My mom wants you to come back. She is throwing fits every day, wanting a grandchild. Help me out. I promise I'll never cheat again. Please, forgive me. His messages, full of empty promises, left me unimpressed. Naturally, I have no intention of going back. Whatever their reasons, I have decided never to see them again. Now, I am back at my parents' home, struggling through the early stages of motherhood with their support. It's tough, but every day, I find joy in my daughter's growth. There may come a day when my daughter will miss having a father, but I hope to shower her with so much love that it will erase any sadness she might feel. Thank you for everything. I gave my husband a respectful nod, handed him the divorce papers, and left the house. He always put work first and couldn't handle household chores. Without me, he'd surely struggle. Let him realize just how helpless he is. My name is Susan. I quit my job right after we got married and became a homemaker. My husband Robert was my former boss, known for his exceptional work skills. Ever since I started working under Robert, he was always there to help. He often gave me advice about work, and eventually we started going out for dinners, privately. We began dating secretly at work and announced our relationship when we decided to get married. When I shared the news of our marriage, many female colleagues were envious. Becoming a homemaker was Robert's idea. However, once we started our married life, Robert began to look down on me. You just laze around at home and still get to eat. You're really lucky. Who do you think provides for this lifestyle? You should be grateful to me. If I tried to go out on a weekday, he'd make a displeased face. Going out for lunch while I'm working? Who do you think earns the money for that lunch? Think about it. I started to feel reluctant to go out, fearing Robert's reaction, and began to stay home more. Is this my life now? Just waiting for Robert to come home? I can't stand this. I felt like I needed a change. Determined, I decided to work outside again. But Robert wouldn't allow me to work part-time. You want to work? Is my salary not enough for you? That's not it. I tried to explain desperately. I feel suffocated staying at home all the time. You think of work as just a breather? Are you taking it lightly? He bombarded me with accusations, but I knew if I backed down, nothing would change. I pleaded with Robert. After much persuasion, he finally agreed to let me work part-time on the condition that I wouldn't neglect household chores. Working outside after a long time was nerve-wracking, but it felt refreshing. I worked hard to ensure Robert had no complaints about the housework after my part-time job. It was tough initially, but I gradually found my rhythm. Around that time, Robert's mother passed away. I informed my part-time job about the sad news and asked for some time off, which they kindly granted. I went back and forth between Robert's family home and our house, preparing for the funeral and taking care of my father-in-law. After the funeral, Robert told me, You only need to visit my family home every other day. Daily cleaning and laundry aren't necessary, right? Just prepare meals that my dad can easily heat up. It seemed he was concerned that his needs would be neglected if I visited his family home daily. If I continued to care for father-in-law, I wouldn't be able to keep my part-time job. When I expressed this to Robert, he responded with annoyance. It doesn't matter if one or two employees are absent, right? Just reduce your working days. If they complain, just quit. It's not like you're earning much. It's just a breather for you. Reluctantly, I reduced my working days, but I felt guilty for constantly asking for flexibility. I wish father-in-law could take care of himself, but father-in-law was adamant. Household chores are a woman's job. He wouldn't do any cleaning or laundry. He was also picky about food. This is too salty. Or, I want something else. For common complaints. Because of this, I often returned home late from his place. 
One such day, father-in-law didn't want to eat the pot roast two days in a row. I had to prepare another meal, which made me late. You're late! What were you doing? Where's my dinner? Robert, already home, shouted angrily. I'm sorry, father-in-law wanted something different, so I had to make another meal. I'll serve dinner, right away. I served Robert the pot roast I brought back. What's this? You promised to take care of the house as usual, right? If this happens again, you'll have to quit your part-time job. Wait a minute, I was late because I went to your family home, not because of my part-time job. Enough! You're stretched thin because of that part-time job. Don't ever make me wait again after I come home from work. I knew arguing wouldn't change his mind, but I couldn't accept it. I continued to juggle household chores, caring for father-in-law and my part-time job, sacrificing sleep. Then one day, I received an unexpected call from my mom. Susan, your dad's been diagnosed with a severe illness and needs to be hospitalized. I learned that dad's cancer was advanced and beyond treatment. I wanted to visit him immediately, but Robert was unsympathetic. Visiting him won't change anything. Focus on our home. Reluctantly, I took early leaves from my part-time job to visit dad. Half a year later, dad passed away. While helping my devastated mom with funeral preparations, I informed Robert about the funeral date. His response was intimidating. You'll be back before I return from work, right? I don't want to wait for dinner again. You're attending the funeral too, right? Why would I? It's a weekday and I have work. My dad just passed away. Can't you take paid leave? In theory, yes, but I have important meetings. It's not that simple. It should be a priority to bid farewell to a family member. When your mom passed, I took several days off. I'm still adjusting my work schedule for you. Robert scoffed. Don't compare your part-time job to mine. I have responsibilities you wouldn't understand. I can't just take time off. After more pleading, he reluctantly agreed. Fine, I'll take a few hours off for the funeral. Saying so, Robert forcibly ended the conversation. With the funeral preparations, I visited my family home more often, took more days off from work, and reduced my visits to father-in-law to every third day. Consequently, I could only manage household chores every third day. Robert grew more irritable. You've been slacking off with the chores. You haven't cleaned in two days. Because... I desperately excused myself to him. I was helping mom all day two days ago and visited father-in-law yesterday. Excuses again? Your mom has been managing the house for years. Why does she need so much help now? After dad's passing, she's too devastated to do anything. I want to be there for her. Robert dismissed her grief. She's just being weak. Your dad's illness wasn't sudden. She should have been prepared. This is why I say woman. How can you say that? Even if she knew losing a lifelong partner is devastating. Can't you understand her feelings? I'm saying she should face reality. Your dad should have planned better. Leaving without preparing his wife is irresponsible. How can you speak of my family like that? Don't you have any respect for them? What's there to respect just because they're older? That's naive thinking. Watching my silent anger, Robert sneered and said, Why should anyone respect your family? Just because they're older? That's naive thinking, isn't it? How can you say that? Not just about my mom, but also about my dad, who passed away after a long illness. That was the moment I decided to cut ties with Robert. I can't... I can't talk to him anymore. Just being in the same room with him makes my skin crawl. I began to secretly prepare to leave the house using the funeral preparations as a cover. I discreetly moved my belongings to my parents' home. It was hard to tell my grieving mom about the current situation, but I couldn't bear it any longer. I couldn't stand Robert's attitude, and I wanted to move back home. When I told my mom, she comforted me, saying, You've done well so far. If Susan wants to come back, I'd be more than happy. It won't be lonely here with you. Thank you, mom. 
It's better to free yourself from Robert and find new happiness than to force a marriage. With those words from my mom, I felt reassured and continued my preparations to leave. I kept my emotions in check, flawlessly handling household chores and taking care of my father-in-law. It's just a little longer of enduring doing things for my husband. As long as I did the housework, Robert didn't complain and we avoided unnecessary conversations. On the day of the funeral, after briefly paying his respects, Robert returned to work without much of a goodbye. Robert, you're really going back to work, huh? My mom looked disappointed. Even though she knew about our situation, she had hoped he would take a break from work during this time. Apparently, that's what Ma was expecting. Did you see, Mom? That's just how he is. Hearing my indifferent comment, my mom replied, Well, I guess there's nothing we can do. We both felt reassured that our decision to divorce was the right one. After the funeral, as usual, Robert returned from work. I'm back. Welcome home. Robert shouted at my curt response. Welcome home? That's it? I took time off work for the funeral because of you. You should thank me. Thank you? Yes, your family interfered with my work. Now say it. Robert sat arrogantly on the sofa, waiting for my response. I bowed slightly to him and said, Thank you for everything so far. What did you just say? So far? What do you mean? I quickly handed Robert the divorce papers. What? Divorce papers? What's this about? It means exactly what it says. I want a divorce. Robert burst into laughter. <laughs> You think you can live without my money? If you have time for jokes, make dinner. I'm serious. I'm leaving to live with my mom. She's okay with it. I've saved some money from my part-time job, and they're considering offering me a full-time position. What? A full-time job? For someone as inefficient as you? Goodbye. I handed the stunned Robert the divorce papers and left with just one bag. When I arrived at my parents' house, I fell asleep talking about my hardships and memories of my dad with my mom. Robert kept contacting me, but I ignored all his messages. His messages were still condescending. How can a wife leave her husband like that? Apologize and come back, and I'll forgive you this time. Ignoring him was the right choice. Robert never came to my parents' house. His pride wouldn't allow it. Thanks to that, my mom and I lived peacefully. A few days later, I realized I left something at the house and sneaked back while Robert was at work. The house was a mess. Garbage and dust were everywhere, with fast food wrappers scattered in the kitchen and wrinkled clothes all over the floor. It seemed Robert hadn't done any housework. I wonder how his dad is doing. As I wandered near Robert's family home, I saw his dad and a caretaker talking at the entrance. Apparently, there were complaints from neighbors about a foul smell from the trash-filled room. If things don't improve, you need to leave immediately. I understand. I'll go to my son's place. That's what father-in-law told caretaker. His son's place? If his dad goes there, it'll just add another man who can't do housework, and the trash will pile up even more. Afterwards, I heard from neighbors that Robert's father had packed his bags and tried to move in with Robert. But Robert refused to live with him, leading to a big argument. Their dispute about living arrangements became the talk of the neighborhood, and eventually Robert had to compromise. Even though they ended up living together, predictably, Robert's house turned into a trash heap, causing a stench that bothered the neighbors. Robert, now going to work in wrinkled and dirty shirts, was quickly losing respect from those around him. There were even talks of him being demoted, and he came to apologize at my parents' house. Susan, I was wrong. Robert? Just when I thought he finally understood, he said condescendingly, are you satisfied now? I apologized. Now fix your attitude and come back. Robert hadn't changed at all. What exactly did you reflect on? What? Why are you acting so high and mighty? You didn't just give a shallow apology, did you? Faced with my calm tone, Robert was speechless. 
please go home. I have no intention of returning to that house. But without you, the house is a mess, and there's my dad to take care of. You just want me back to take care of you and your dad, right? Uh, well, you might think you're competent at work, but if you can't manage your own life, you're worse than a child. What? How dare you talk to your husband like that? Not husband, ex-husband. We're getting a divorce, so we're strangers now. Wait, I don't want a divorce. Shut up, I am not your servant. You always look down on homemakers. Men like you, stuck in the past and domineering, should just be buried in your trash-filled houses. Stay away from me, you arrogant jerk. I shouted at Robert, locked the door behind him, and when I turned around, my mom was clapping, saying, Well said. After that, I started the divorce mediation process. Fortunately, the offer for a full-time position progressed smoothly, and it seemed I could earn enough to live comfortably with my mom. My mom, who had been down after losing my dad, was gradually regaining her spirits now that I was back. Life with just the two of us is now fulfilling and joyful. According to my lawyer, Robert and his dad are still living in their trash-filled house. Known in the neighborhood as the useless father-son duo, they're the subject of gossip. Robert, unable to sleep properly because of the trash, is always sleep-deprived. As a result, he lost focus, made a significant mistake at work, and was forced to resign. Without the means to hire a housekeeper, their future looks bleak. Looking back, I feel foolish for trying so hard to please Robert. I'm grateful to have escaped a life of constant endurance. From now on, I'll live my life to the fullest. At my age, celebrating a birthday? It's just too much. Should I put a candle on the cake for every year? With that many, I'm not sure I could blow them all out. The woman in front of me glared, her face turning bright red. I wished she could understand my frustration. After all, my arms and legs were broken, and I was in pain all over. Yet, she just wouldn't let it go. But this ridiculous relationship will finally end. I hope she goes to hell. My name is Harper. I'm a 31-year-old office worker. After graduating from college, I got a job at a local company and met my husband, Henry, through a colleague. At first, he was just a quiet guy at the bar during our office parties. But after getting his contact from a colleague, he started reaching out and we began going out for drinks and hanging out. One day, after a few such outings, a blushing Henry confessed his feelings for me. I felt the same way, so I happily accepted. After dating for a few years, he proposed. My family is very close, and I want to build a warm home with Harper. He told me that. Little did I know, years later, I'd face such a nightmare. Starting next year, I'll be transferred. It's back to my hometown. I heard this from my husband a year after our marriage. I thought, so the time has finally come. His company transfers him every few years. We currently live in my hometown, but not his. His family home is quite far, over an hour by plane. I knew about the transfers when we got married, so I was mentally prepared. I never thought of divorcing or living separately because of this. I've only ever left my hometown for trips or work training, so leaving was a bit scary, but knowing he'd be with me was comforting. My mom and the others are excited to see us more often. Hearing that made me a bit uneasy, and there was a reason. My husband has an older brother, brother-in-law who got married to his high school classmate, sister-in-law, due to a shotgun wedding when he was 19. Brother-in-law, who had just started working, lived with his in-laws due to financial constraints. Their son, born around that time, is now in middle school. I sometimes wonder why they don't move out and live on their own, but it seems the reason is mother-in-law and sister-in-law. They are as close as a real mother and daughter. Before the transfer, 
we visited his family a few times a year. But after marrying, I couldn't just be a guest. I tried to help in the kitchen. But they'd say, Oh, Harper, just relax, we've got this. Yeah, Harper, leave this to us. But um, the hallway's a bit dirty. Could you clean it? They'd chat away happily after pushing me out. I didn't feel completely left out, but I did feel alienated. When I left the room, I could hear their laughter. Were they talking behind my back? Well, there's a difference between a daughter-in-law of several years and one of few months. I hoped we'd get along someday, but every visit to my in-laws made me feel isolated. Seeing me with nothing to do, my husband would call out, Come here, Harper. Let's drink together. Mother-in-law and sister-in-law looked at me as if I was slacking off. Yet, when they spoke, it was with a fake smile. We're fine over here. What do they want from me? So every time I visited my in-laws, I felt mentally drained. Father-in-law and brother-in-law were kind. And brother-in-law's son, Kenta, though a bit distant, probably due to his teenage years, would respond if spoken to. You two seem close, but Harper's here too. Include her in the conversation. Father-in-law would often say that perhaps out of concern. On such occasions, they'd invite me with a smile. We were just about to call you, Harper. But once I joined, mother-in-law and sister-in-law would burst into laughter over some private joke. Did something happen? Even when I tried to join in, I'd get a dismissive, oh, something like that, <laughs> from both. It feels so familiar. Oh, I remember, in school, after a fight with a friend, she spread rumors about me and all the girls in class ignored me. Yet, in front of the teacher, they acted like best friends. The feeling at my in-laws was eerily similar. But I'm an adult now, in my late 20s to early 30s, acting childish at this age. From then on, I stopped trying to get close. My husband noticed the tension between me, mother-in-law, and sister-in-law. You don't have to force yourself. My mom and sister-in-law are acting childish. He'd say, always on my side. He once confronted them about their attitude towards me, but it didn't change. I asked him not to bring it up anymore and not wanting to make things worse. After my husband's transfer, I left my long-time job. With no kids... I didn't plan to be a homemaker. I started job hunting immediately after moving and was fortunate to find a full-time position close to home. Starting at a new company was nerve-wracking, but my colleagues and boss were kind and welcoming. After the cold treatment from mother-in-law and sister-in-law, this warmth was comforting. However, a new issue arose. Frequent messages from sister-in-law Harper, you haven't visited in a while. Are you busy? As your senior in marriage, I think visiting is a form of respect, don't you think? There was so much written about it. At first I was happy to hear from sister-in-law and replied promptly. She'd always respond within minutes. But with work, I couldn't always check my phone. Despite not replying, sister-in-law kept messaging. One lunch break... I found 10 messages from her. It was a bit unsettling. Is she that free? Eventually, my delayed responses upset her. Are my messages bothering you? I get it. Fine, then. After that, the messages stopped. When I talked to my husband, he said, This is pretty insane. My brother mentioned it, too. It seems sister-in-law has a really short temper. One moment, she'd send me an angry message, and the next, she'd apologize. Then, she'd get angry again. I thought, she must be so busy. Perhaps because of her temperament, I heard that the brother-in-law couple often argue. Even when sister-in-law is clearly in the wrong, mother-in-law intervenes, making things worse. Weren't they a close-knit family? When I asked my husband, he said that ever since sister-in-law got married, 
the atmosphere at home started to change. Mother-in-law always wanted a daughter and adore sister-in-law. I thought, I'm a woman too, right? But I had no desire to get close to such people. I just wanted them to do their own thing. But then, out of the blue, I got a call from an unexpected person. It was mother-in-law. I was a bit taken aback, but I took a deep breath and answered. Hello, Harper, mother-in-law with a slightly cheerful voice said. She's having a birthday party soon and would love for my husband and me to attend. Oh, you don't have to bring a gift or anything. She repeated that three times during the call. So she's basically saying, come celebrate my birthday and bring a gift. I've never been invited by the birthday person themselves before. Typical of her, I thought. I'll have to check with Henry when he gets home, I replied. Mother-in-law said, If it's really not possible for both of you, just you will do. And don't worry about the gift. With that, she hung up. I have work too, but it seems she's already decided I'm attending. Usually she'd want both of us there, but she must really want a gift this time. I sighed. When I discussed it with my husband after he came home, he said he had an important business meeting that day and couldn't make it. When I informed mother-in-law, she said, That's fine. Just you, Harper. I'll be waiting. And she hung up. I mean, I have work too. I could have chosen not to go, but I thought I'd try to fulfill the duties sister-in-law always talks about. So... I decided to attend alone. By then, I had some paid leave, which I reluctantly used. Before I knew it, the day arrived. I headed to my in-laws' house earlier than the time mentioned. When I entered, sister-in-law was busily cooking. It was awkward since we hadn't met since that message. I greeted her, but she didn't respond. In the living room, an excited mother-in-law was eagerly waiting. She had asked me to decorate the room, so I hung up the various decorations I bought. She just stared at them in silence. I wish she'd go somewhere else. It looks... plain... and cheap. She whispered so that I could hear and quickly went to the kitchen. After a while, sister-in-law came into the living room and said, Hey, can you get the cake? I'm tied up right now. She glared at me looked around the decorated room and muttered, Lex charm. I felt embarrassed being told that. I'll finish up here and then head out, I said. Sister-in-law laughed and replied, With these unimpressive decorations? <laughs> What's the point now? You should have said something sooner. Not wanting to provoke her further, I took the reservation slip from the cake she handed me with the dismissive gesture. Feeling a bit annoyed, I headed to the front door. Oh, by the way, I told them you'd be paying today, she said and then slammed the door behind me. Really? She couldn't have said that any differently? I considered just leaving, but I thought better of it and headed to a nearby bakery with a heavy heart. Here it is, the clerk said, showing me the cake. I was taken aback. It was a custom-made cake large enough for a crowd, surrounded by whipped cream and fruits. There was an illustration of a family in the center. Seeing it made me incredibly sad. It was based on a family photo taken during my first visit to my in-laws. But I wasn't in the cake's illustration. Sister-in-law probably requested to exclude me. The clerk, noticing my reaction, seemed uncomfortable. The bill was $80, which shocked me further. If I had known the cake was this big, I would have driven. As I was walking back, I noticed a car swerving dangerously. Before I knew it, the car jumped the curb and headed straight for me. The pain hit me instantly. Someone's been hit! Call an ambulance! I heard a kind voice before blacking out. When I came to... I was in a hospital bed. A doctor explained my injuries. A broken right arm and leg. 
Thankfully, my head was fine. The driver had fallen asleep at the wheel. Do you have someone we can contact? I gave them my husband's contact as well as mother-in-law and sister-in-laws, thinking they might be worried. I noticed the slightly crushed cake box next to me. I must have thrown it when I saw the car coming. I was dozing off when my phone kept ringing. Answering it, I heard, Where are you? It's my birthday. I heard you had a minor accident, but you're okay, right? Hurry back and help with the preparations. She hung up without waiting for a reply. My broken arm and leg told a different story. I'm done with this family. They better brace themselves. I pleaded with the doctor to let me leave, promising to return soon, and headed to my in-laws. With a strong ally by my side, I wasn't afraid. When I arrived, the two of them were waiting outside, probably eager to make a snide remark. As I transferred from the car to a borrowed wheelchair, mother-in-law stammered. Wait, did you break bones? What happened? Seeing my injuries, she seemed genuinely shaken. My right arm and leg were casted, and I had numerous scrapes and bruises. It was clear to anyone that my injuries weren't minor. I came because mother-in-law insisted. Here's your birthday cake. And good news. Henry came to support me. Henry pushes my wheelchair. After finishing a business call, he had rushed over when he heard the voicemail from the hospital while I was napping. He was by my side when the call from my mother-in-law came in, shaking with anger as he listened to the conversation with me. He told me we didn't have to go, but I pleaded, and he humbly spoke with the doctor for me. Are you out of your mind? Look at Harper. How is this a minor injury? Tell me. It was the first time I had seen him so furious. My mother-in-law responded. No, you've got it wrong. I don't like answering calls from unknown numbers. The only reason I picked up the hospital's call was... She glanced sideways at my sister-in-law. It seemed she hadn't expected my condition to be this severe and she hadn't anticipated my husband's arrival either, as she was at a loss for words. Then, What's all this commotion about? came a voice. With that, my father-in-law and others emerged from the house. What? Harper! You're seriously injured! I heard it was just a scratch from a fall! All eyes turned to my sister-in-law. Well, anyone can mishear things. She tried to defend herself, but such a transparent lie, nobody would believe it. My brother-in-law said to her, What were you thinking? Apologize to Harper. Why should I apologize? I didn't hit her with my car, she retorted. What a way to dig her own grave. The story about a scratch from a fall was a lie she made up. Let's just move on. Oh, want to see the cake? It's amazing. I said, and with my husband's help, I took the cake out of its box. Whether it landed just right, or was secured really well, it was nothing short of a miracle. I was badly hurt, but the cake was nearly unscathed. Seeing the cake, my father-in-law and the others grew even angrier. Hey, why isn't Harper in this photo? Faced with this question, my sister-in-law, who had ordered the cake, desperately said, Oh my, it must be the bakery's mistake. I'll call and complain. She tried to escape the awkward situation, but I stopped her. Wait a moment. Look at this. I signaled to my husband. In my phone's photo gallery was a picture given to me by a cake shop employee. It was probably the final design of the cake and there was a big note saying, At the customer's request, cut out this person. My sister-in-law hadn't noticed, but the cake shop employee told me. Actually, I went to middle school with her. She used to ostracize me. She's still doing such childish things. She had given me the photo, saying I could use it if I wanted. Sister-in-law, you're still doing your foolish things even as an adult. Everyone glared at her, except for my mother-in-law. But she alone said, 
do you enjoy blaming her so much? She said it was a mistake. You're so unpleasant. She glared at me. Everyone wondered what she was talking about. Moreover, she had opened the present I brought while I was away and mocked the scarf inside, saying it was an unattractive color. That's too bad. We put so much thought into it, right, Henry? At my words, my mother-in-law looked puzzled. That's because the scarf was a gift. My husband had spent an hour choosing at a department store since he couldn't attend today. My mom and I both love yellow. We used to say we were alike because of it when I was a kid. He shared such a heartwarming story with me. Yet, they treated him like this. My mother-in-law, trembling, shouted, It's all your fault! Everything! On such a special day! She was so loud and obnoxious that I retorted, Act your age! It's just a birthday! Are you nuts? Should we put a candle on the cake for every year you've been alive? I'm not sure you'd be able to blow them all out. I didn't regret saying it, because today would be the last time I'd see my mother-in-law. We're leaving. Mom, sister, you two are out of your minds. We won't be coming back here. We don't want to see you again. We don't need any inheritance. Goodbye, Henry said, pushing my wheelchair away. The family he once loved was nowhere to be seen. He chose me over his own parents. That made me so happy. The aftermath was chaotic. My father-in-law offered my mother-in-law a divorce. She didn't accept easily, saying, You should reconsider, father-in-law. I thought, how dare she? But then my sister-in-law chimed in. Is this the time to worry about others? My brother-in-law said to her, What? My sister-in-law looked puzzled as my brother-in-law, like my father-in-law, proposed a divorce. Apparently, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law had been out partying from morning till night lately. My retired father-in-law took care of most of the household chores. He had been patient, thinking she had supported him for many years, but he was fed up with her attitude towards me and the fact that they had been neglecting their grandson, Kenta. Moreover, right after Kenta was born, my sister-in-law claimed she had postpartum depression and went back to her parents' house. It turned out she was lying and just wanted to party. When her parents found out, they disowned her. She had no place to go, so she clung to my mother-in-law. She also lied to my mother-in-law, saying I had bad-mouthed her. Mother-in-law, who easily believed that, is also mother-in-law. I was dumbfounded when I heard this. I hope those two malicious women live happily ever after. I don't need such a family. In the end, they couldn't come to an agreement. I'll give you the house. Do whatever you want. And my father-in-law said. They agreed to divorce when they realized they'd get the house. But my ex-sister-in-law said, Make sure you pay child support. To which my brother-in-law replied, Why would I? I'm not giving you custody. She threatened to sue. But he had no intention of giving up custody. And Kenta said, I'd obviously go with dad. She was counting on the child support but the divorce papers were already filled and the divorce was finalized. You can't live on a house alone. I hope she struggles. A few months later, I was still working. We have an interview today. Please join me. At my company, an employee always attends interviews to provide feedback. E excuse me? I couldn't hide my shock when I saw the nervous person who walked in for the interview. She was wearing a wrinkled suit and dirty pumps, clearly not dressed appropriately for an interview. To my surprise, it was my former sister-in-law. I almost laughed out loud. She must have been attending countless interviews and had forgotten that I worked here. Her interview responses were terrible, and it was clear she wouldn't be hired even if I didn't say anything. She had no work experience, and when asked about it, she said, I was taking care of my ex-husband's parents after our divorce. 
I struggled to hold back my laughter. When my boss asked if I had any questions, I said, It's wonderful that you're so family-oriented. What would you do if, during work hours, you got a call from a hospital saying a loved one had an accident and needed you right away? I looked straight into her eyes as I asked. She avoided my gaze and replied in a soft voice. Of course I'd go to the hospital immediately. The interview ended after I thanked her. My boss asked about the intent behind my question. I explained everything and he was shocked. Unsurprisingly, she wasn't hired. That was the last time I saw my former sister-in-law. Years later, I spoke to someone living near my former in-laws. They said the two women still live together, but their constant shouting matches could be heard daily, sometimes even requiring police intervention. Apparently, my former sister-in-law could only get part-time jobs and never held on to them for long. They were scraping by on my former mother-in-law's pension. She chose her daughter over her son, and husband of many years. I wonder if she ever regretted that decision. It's none of my business now. I still keep in touch with my father-in-law and the rest. We recently went on an overnight trip together. My brother-in-law's son, Kenta, is starting college in the spring. He's grown up so much, and it makes me realize how fast time flies. The only ones stuck in time are those two women, as I pondered this, my mobile phone rang on my way home from work. Mom, come home soon! It was a call from my beloved daughter, whom my husband Henry and I were blessed with after everything. I couldn't help but smile. I'll be home soon, I replied and hurried home to my loving family. My name is Amelia. I'm a 40-year-old housewife. My husband Charlton is 35, and we have been married for five years. We are a happy couple, just the two of us. I grew up with just my dad, who worked a corporate job after my mom passed away when I was young. I was always worried that if I got married, my dad would be left alone. Even when I was dating someone, I hesitated to take the plunge into marriage. Whenever I talked about my hesitation, people would say it's because I'm a daddy's girl who loves her father too much. That's when I met my current husband. He understood how much I care for my dad and even said he would be okay with us living with him. That sealed the deal and I decided to marry him. My dad was thrilled when I told him the news. I am so happy. Now I can face your mother in heaven. Don't worry about me, just focus on being happy with Charlton. Charlton? Please, take good care of my daughter. Make her happy, especially because she has had to struggle with just one parent. My dad had never said it, but he had been worried that my being raised by a single parent might be a reason for me not getting married. He also runs a real estate agency while working his corporate job. We received a new house as a wedding gift from my dad and lived happily. Then, two years ago, my dad retired at 65. After retiring, he seemed to lose his energy and seemed to age rapidly. So I started calling him every day and visiting him regularly to check on him. My husband's work schedule changed, leading to more overtime so I started visiting my dad even more. One day, I couldn't reach my dad at the usual time, so I went to check on him. I found him collapsed in the bathroom. I called an ambulance immediately but he never regained consciousness. Tests revealed he had suffered a brain hemorrhage and was hospitalized. I visited him every day but he never woke up and eventually passed away. I held back my tears as I said my final goodbyes and began arranging the funeral. The funeral was a small family affair but some relatives showed up claiming they were promised inheritance. Thankfully, my dad had left a will in my name so I inherited all his savings and properties. I felt my dad's love even after he was gone and it filled my heart. I had no idea that more challenges were yet to come. My husband's family is generally sensible but there is one sister-in-law who's terrible with money. Hey Amelia, you inherited from your dad, right? We're sisters now, even if it's by marriage. Help me out, I'm in trouble. 
She's been in debt and has been asking for money quite shamelessly. I've been turning her down, but it's getting stressful. Then one day, I received an email. It was an invitation to a class reunion. As I was pondering whether to attend the class reunion, my husband Charlton spoke up. What's got you looking so serious? Uh, there is a class reunion coming up, but I'm not really in the mood, especially after dad passed away. Maybe it will be a good change of pace. Your dad wouldn't want you to be down all the time. You're right. Encouraged by my husband, I decided to go to the reunion. When the day arrived, I was enjoying catching up with old friends. While I was alone getting a new drink, a classmate approached me. Amelia, long time no see. Um, sorry? Who are you? Out. Don't recognize me. I'm Cody. I couldn't quite remember him, but he seemed to know me. Wanna catch up? Just then, one of my old friends called out, Amelia, where's that drink? Snapping back to reality, I said, sorry, uh, my friends are waiting and left. My friend quickly approached me looking concerned. Are you okay? Did that guy bother you? No, we were just talking. He said his name was Cody, but who is he? He's that unreliable playboy from the baseball team. Good looking and athletic, remember? Oh, uh, right. He looks different now, so I didn't recognize him. Be careful, he's still a playboy. And he was eyeing you. Come on, I'm married. I'm not exactly young anymore. I laughed it off then, but Cody kept trying to engage me. I managed to avoid him until the end of the first part of the reunion, but then he cornered me. Why are you avoiding me, Amelia? It hurts. Are you maybe interested in me? Don't be ridiculous. Why so defensive? Just be honest. I'm married, you know. So? Plenty of married people still play around. Plus, I have always liked you. How about we go for drinks? Uh, no thank you. If you want to drink, go to the after party. I managed to shake him off and caught a taxi home. I thought that would be the last of Cody, but more trouble was waiting for me. The next day, while I was working at the cafe, where I have a part-time job, a familiar man walked in. As I approached with a glass of water, I realized it was Cody. What are you doing here? Just a coincidence. Lucky me, running into Amelia. Don't lie. Who told you? Relax. Let me place an order first. One blended coffee. Reluctantly, I took his order and made his coffee. Leave after you finish this. It says all limited refills during this time. I'll take my time. After Cody took his sweet time chatting and sipping three cups of coffee, he finally paid his bill. Just so you know, I'll be a regular here from now on, he said, ignoring the atmosphere. I couldn't exactly kick out a customer, so I found myself serving Cody every day. I tried talking to my manager, but without any real harm done, there was nothing they could do. I wanted to consult my husband, but he was swamped with work and rarely home. Then, on a day off from my part-time job, I returned from shopping to a shocking sight. Welcome back, Amelia. You're late. Cody was at my house. How did you find out where I live? Who knows? Maybe we're just fated to be together? Stop being creepy and leave. Why not ditch your workaholic husband and be with me? I'll treat you right. Cody tried to put his arm around me. A chill ran down my spine and I had had enough. I pushed him away. Days later, my sister-in-law visited while my husband was home. We need to talk, they both said, looking serious. You have been acting strange since the reunion. You're seeing another man, aren't you? What are you talking about? Don't play dumb. We have evidence. Sister-in-law flipped over the envelope she was holding. Out spilled a bunch of photos of me hanging out with a guy named Cody. Pictures from a recent reunion, some from my workplace, and even one where Cody had his arm around me in front of my house. The photos were cleverly taken to look like we were having secret meetings. If you only saw these, you would think I was cheating for sure. This is irrefutable evidence. We're getting a divorce and you owe me $50,000. Pay up all at once. My husband and sister-in-law were smirking. It was clear they were trying to frame me for cheating. I decided to play along. Fine, if you insist on a divorce, let's do it. Don't worry about the settlement or alimony. I'll handle it all properly. At my words, my husband and sister-in-law exchanged triumphant glances. But I had no intention of letting them off the hook. From here on out, I will push both of you into hell. Oh, uh, by the way, the inheritance I got from my dad isn't part of the marital assets. What? My husband and sister-in-law were stunned. 
My husband was the first to come to his senses. Why not? Money earned after marriage is supposed to be split evenly. True, for money we have earned while married. But inheritance from my deceased parents isn't something we acquire together, so it's not part of the settlement. Didn't know that, did you? Too bad for you. What? How do I know all this? Cody told me everything. Turns out I had consulted the police the day Cody showed up at my house. Cody got scared after a warning from the police and spilled the beans the next day. Uh, I'm really sorry, my co-worker just asked me to seduce Amelia, that's all. Cody deeply apologized and spilled everything he knew. Turns out, Cody was a junior colleague of my sister-in-law at work. My sister-in-law had heard about a reunion from her husband and said, Cody, you went to school with my sister-in-law, right? Set a honey trap for her. If my brother and his wife divorce, we'll get some money from the settlement. I'll give you a cut if it works. Cody got manipulated by sister-in-law and started getting close to me, while they took photos to document it. They were trying to blackmail me with these fabricated proofs of infidelity. Oh, wait a minute, you're saying I set this guy up? How can you prove it without any evidence? Sister-in-law denied it. I have evidence. Take a look at this. I showed them my phone screen. I had saved the text exchanges between Cody and sister-in-law and separately the text between sister-in-law and my husband. The text read, I was so surprised to bump into you in front of the hotel. Me too. Keep my girlfriend a secret. Of course. You keep quiet about the guy I was with too. Deal. Your girlfriend is stunning. How did you meet her? She is a co-worker in my department. We met after a transfer. I'm so happy after being with her every day. You're bull, cheating so openly and not getting caught. If I say it's over time, Emilia doesn't ask more. She has been so down since her father passed. I couldn't stand it otherwise. Wow. <laughs> Poor Emilia. Actually, I want to divorce Emilia and marry her. Hmm, I have an idea. Let's make it look like Amelia cheated, even if she doesn't fall for the honey trap. We'll have the photos and evidence. We can get compensation and a share of the inheritance. Both my husband and sister-in-law panicked after seeing the saved text. How did you get this? Charlton, what does her mean? Sister-in-law, you're engaged and you're cheating too? You think I would cheat just because you are? Give me that phone. Delete it now. My husband tried to snatch the phone from my hand. Oops, my hand slipped. I narrowly managed to forward the screenshots of the text exchanges to someone. My husband looked at the phone screen he had just snatched from me, his face drained of color. You've got to be kidding, D dad Hurry up, long press the image and cancel the message. Both were panicking, but in the meantime, my father-in-law had already read the message. Realizing that I had accidentally forwarded the SMS screenshots to father-in-law, my husband and sister-in-law turned pale. Soon after, my phone rang, it was father-in-law. Charlton, you messed up, so you answer it. No way, that was your idea, sis. You take responsibility. My husband and sister-in-law were pushing my phone back and forth. Finally, sister-in-law said, you deal with it, and handed me back the phone. I answered and explained everything to father-in-law. That night, a family meeting was called at my in-law's house. As expected, my husband and sister-in-law got an earful. You both cheated and tried to frame an innocent woman? Shame on you. We owe a lot to Amelia's father. How dare you betray that trust? My usually calm mother-in-law looked disgusted and father-in-law was furious. Turns out, my dad and father-in-law had a long-standing business relationship and my dad had helped father-in-law in times of need. Father-in-law turned to me and bowed deeply. I'm so sorry for my foolish daughter and son. I don't know how to apologize. After that, I decided to seek compensation from sister-in-law, my husband and Cody through a lawyer. Despite the pending divorce and compensation, my husband packed his bags and left, going off the grid. I had a private investigator look into it and found out he had run off to his mistress's house. I was dumbfounded. I sent documents demanding compensation for adultery to both their workplaces. As a result, my husband and his cheating partner were in a bad position within the company and my husband was relegated to another department. This led to my husband being demoted and his mistress who was part-time getting fired. While investigating my husband, I also had sister-in-law's affairs looked into. Turns out, she had not one, but two lovers. 
I informed her fiancé and my in-laws and sent them the evidence. Naturally, sister-in-law's engagement was called off and she was also sued for compensation. Afterwards, my husband and sister-in-law turned to their parents for help, but they refused and cut ties. They never thought their plan to frame me for cheating would backfire like this. Thanks to my lawyer, the divorce went through smoothly. While I felt relief, I also realized I was now alone, especially since my dad had passed away. I thought I would be lonely, but thanks to my supportive friends and my former in-laws, who had been incredibly kind, I am doing surprisingly well. Every now and then, my ex-husband reaches out. His messages are either about wanting to get back together, saying things like, you're the only one for me, or asking for loans. I ignore them and send screenshots to father-in-law each time. My ex gets scolded by father-in-law again. Does he not have a learning function in his brain? Maybe he doesn't have a brain at all. Since then, Cody has stopped showing up at the cafe where I work. Now that I'm divorced and don't have to worry about anything, I have decided to work there as a full-time employee. Moving forward, I plan to manage the inheritance my dad left me while working harder than ever.